My name's Robert Mann. I'm the convener of um, what we call the Ideas in Society program. A few weeks ago, it was suggested to me um, that we should have a look at what's happening with the Rudd government. Uh, and the, the reason is that, um, in my experience, there's almost never been um, a government, not whose popularity has fallen so quickly, but whose credibility has fallen so quickly. Um, in, in, in some ways, the, the problems are almost obvious. Um, the problem of a prime minister whose language is of, of moral grandiosity, but who very quickly in the last while has um, decided that something else is to dominate. And probably, I think historians will find the decision over the ETS, the moral turning point in this government. But anyhow, there's that, but, but that's been combined, I think, uh, with clear bureaucratic ineptitude, something that I think was not associated with Mr. Rudd uh, over the insulation and the um, schools building program, which I think public opinion now accepts has been pretty major bureaucratic incompetence. And com combined with something that when this was being planned, I, I hadn't thought about so much, which is pure party political incompetence or political incompetence uh, seen with the way in which a major review of taxation, the Henry Review, was commissioned. Uh, most, uh, most of it ignored, one bit acted upon, which has led you know, to sort of the, the, the opposite problem from the problem of the ETS, suddenly having a gigantic um, uh, political problem of taking on a very powerful vested interest, having a few weeks ago, um, or a few weeks before, decided it was too risky to have a double dissolution election and to back the, you know, the ETS, which was the greatest moral challenge humanity faced. Anyhow, so it seemed to me that I wanted then to bring together um, the people who I think would be most able to illuminate this sudden change of fortune um, and credibility in the government. And the three people I asked, I'm extremely pleased to say, the three people I most wanted to come here uh, to discuss this issue have all agreed. The first speaker will be someone who's been at La Trobe almost as long as me, which goes back to the 18th century. Um, <laughs> and that's my colleague uh, and friend, Judith Brett, uh, who's professor of politics um, and also at, the pre at present the head of school of the School of Social Sciences. Um, Judy is the author of a number of very important books, um, two of which I'll mention. Uh, Robert Menzies' Forgotten People, uh, an award-winning book, and another award-winning book, um, Liberals, Australian Liberals and the Moral Middle Class. Um, and I think one can say of her, she's one of the most uh, incisive academic commentators on Australian politics and the clear authority on the long-term liberal tradition in Australia, liberal with a small l. Uh, she's presently uh, writing a book on Alfred Deakin. Um, the second speaker um, is uh, going to be Paul Kelly. Um, it's not that I've always agreed with what Paul Kelly has said, uh, as he knows, but I have um, always regarded him as the most important um, uh, political commentator, um, for me at least, um, since the period of the Whitlam government. Um, Paul has been, was a very successful editor-in-chief of The Australian. Um, he was, he's now editor-at-large. I think in a university, his most important contributions have been his books, um, one of which changed the way we looked at Australian politics, The End of Certainty, and another of which um, is, prevent, provides a really um, unusual interpretation of the relationship between Paul Keating and um, John Howard called March of Patriots, published only a few months ago. Um, I'm really very pleased and honoured uh, that Paul's come here today and he just told me that this is the first time he has visited this university, but I very much hope and it's not the last. That's up to you. Um, 
And the final speaker is someone also I've admired enormously, um, whose writing I haven't known for as long as I've known Paul's, but Lenore Taylor uh, was, with Paul Kelly, almost the only journalist that I enjoyed reading at The Australian for a very long time. Uh, and I was particularly taken not only with her profound understanding of Australian party politics, which was obvious, but something that was more unusual, which is a real depth with public policy. And um, Lenore was immensely important I think for many, many years as analysing policy, not just the party political game. Uh, she was at the Australian for a long time. Uh, she tells me she began with the Canberra Times, she spent some time with the Finn Review. Uh, she's now with the Sydney Morning Herald and I read her terrific work online. And she's just about to publish a book with the um, polite title, Shitstorm. Um, which is about the Rudd government, with David Uren, which is about the Rudd government and its handling of the global financial crisis. So with that, um, just to, to give you some idea of what's happening, th there'll be three talks of about 15 minutes each. Then there's, there'll be a panel discussion in which, which I'll ask everyone to comment on some general propositions to do with what's happened to the Rudd government. And then I hope there'll be time for a few questions at the end. So uh, with that, let me invite Judy to begin proceeding. Thanks, Robert, and thanks very much for asking me. And as Robert said, the big question for today is why Rudd is making such a mess of his first term of government. Why, with having been elected with such high hopes, his star is falling so fast? Now, I've been thinking hard about this, since, particularly since Robert asked me to do it, um, and it's an incredibly puzzling question. What I'm going to do today is just present two lines of, of thinking about this, um, because I wanted to try to think of things that wouldn't be all too repetitive. The first focuses on the failure of policy implementation, and the second on what I think is Rudd's fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of political power in Australia. So I'm going to begin with failures of implementation. Now, the two spectacular failures which we all know about are the insulation scheme and building the education revolution. The insulation scheme, which as we hear over and over again, killed four young men, caused some hundred or more house fires, risks a further unknown number, it's making you know, the pensioners of the nation anxious, and was widely rorted by enterprising small businesses, many of which sprang up overnight to meet the sudden demand from the government for home roofing insulation. Some were just less than competent and others were frauds, billing the government for work that was never done. Building the education revolution is delivering overpriced and inadequate buildings to schools in the state-run education system, while schools in the Catholic system are getting much more value for their dollar. And the Australian has run a relentless um, and extremely informative campaign on this. Um, I think it's, it's really been fantastic, the campaign they've done on building the education revolution in particular. And it's revealed shocking price gouging uh, in the publicly delivered building programs as uh, layers of managers and consultants extract fees before ever the shovel hits the ground and the tradies come in. Now these two schemes were part of the government's response to the global financial crisis to stimulate the economy by the government going out on two massive buying sprees of goods and services from Australia's home maintenance and construction industry. The schemes were always adventurous taking the federal government into areas controlled by state regulation in which it had very little experience. And there is little to indicate that Rudd really understood the risks he was exposing his government to. So the question I really wanted to ask is what, why didn't they understand those risks? What, can we dig a little deeper down to try to understand what's gone wrong here? And what I, I think is one way, one context at least, at which, which provides some insight into it, is to go back to the decades of the 1980s and 90s to what I think is a fairly poorly misunderstood uh, aspect of the neoliberal reforms of that era, which goes by the name of the new public management. In Australia, we used the general term economic rationalism in the 80s and 90s to cover neoliberal reforms, uh, which the, the neoliberal reforms which started to be introduced after Labor was elected in 83. Now the fundamental aims of these reforms was to increase the role of the market in the distribution of the nation's resources and to decrease the role of the state. The dollar was floated, tariffs reduced, restrictions on the financial sector and the flow of credit were significantly relaxed. 
government enterprises such as the state-owned banks and transport and power utilities were privatised. And I think in many people's minds that's what they, that's what they associate with neoliberal, that, that period of neoliberal economic reform. But as well as that, and something that was much less visible, I think, to the general public, there was um, a revolution in much of the way the public service operated, particularly the service delivery agencies. The idea of the new public management was to introduce competition into the delivery of government provided services. And so the argument went, this would increase efficiency and hence value to the taxpayer. But there was more to it than that. The, the, the aim was also to break with the old one size fits all uniform service delivery. Uh, and to provide flexibility and choice for citizens. And this is the point at which we as citizens who received government services got renamed as customers and, and consumers. And you, I can remember you know, being puzzled, you know, those points when you're on Flinders Street Station when you stopped being addressed as a passenger and got called a customer. Uh, and, but this was part, it was like there was two, two different sets of motivation behind the new public management. One was competition and, and better, better value for money. But the other was also to introduce flexibility and choice, given the much more complex um, society that, that, that a government now had to service. Now, much of this reform was taking place at the level of the states, and in Victoria, Jeff Kennett was the great advocate of what is of the new public management. The basic idea was simple. Governments should not be in the business of providing services that can be provided more efficiently, more flexibly, and with more consumer choice by the private sector. Governments, the slogan went, should steer, not row. That is, they should make the policy decisions, like Australia should increase the number of houses with roofing insulation, but they shouldn't themselves take on the task of insulating all those roofs with a government-employed workforce. Instead, they should contract these services out to private providers through a process of competitive tendering and contracts to ensure quality and efficiency of the product that was delivered. One of the central arguments was that this would reduce the bloated workforce of the public enterprises, which were insulated from the rigours of the market. And though this was never trumpeted so loudly, it would reduce the power of the public sector unions. But there was always here the sort of image of the lazy public servant or the lazy council worker, um, you know, or the, the lazy road worker. The result was a massive shifting of resources from the public to the private sector, as a huge range of services which were previously delivered by government employees were outsourced from prisons to employment services to cleaning and maintenance work. New businesses were started to do this work, such as Theresa Ryan's business, which provides employment services to people with disabilities. Uh, and lots of Businesses like Theresa Ryan's have made fortunes, if you like, out of this, this, this shift of resources. Other businesses expanded, and the state public works departments shrank or closed down, with construction companies filling the gap. They would now build the schools, hospitals, and other buildings the government needed. The result was that the government became a major buyer of goods and services provided by the public sector. However, as the government enterprises and service departments shrank, Governments lost a great number of experienced staff, many of whom re-established themselves in the private sector, selling their services to government as private contractors that they once provided as paid employees. And as part of this process, I know this is all sound, sounds like a lecture, which <laughs> it is a bit, <laughs> um, but as part of this process, government lost a great deal of technical expertise. And to give just one example, a report that the Institution of Engineers Australia did in 2000 after these two decades of reform, estimated that during the 1990s there was a decline in the number of engineers employed by governments at all levels by between 20 and 40 per cent. And the same report sounded a warning as to potential consequences of what it called the de-engineering of the public sector and the parallel loss in other areas of technical expertise. It was interested in engineers, but it said you can see similar things with lawyers, accountants, economists, scientists, IT professionals, urban planners, a whole range of people, if you like, who provided expert knowledge inside of governments. It made it harder, it argued, for the government to be an informed purchaser. Two distinct sets of skills are needed to be an informed buyer contracting expertise and subject matter expertise. That is, you need to know something about what you're buying. Uh, as this decline within the public sector agencies out in the marketplace, um, that were out in the marketplace, then the report warned there was a significant increase 
in the risk of uninformed purchasing decisions by government, leading to significant financial loss. And that seems to me to be, in a nutshell, the process, uh, the major factor of what we've seen in the cost blowout of the, of the building education revolution. A significant decrease in, in actually informed purchasing pe people who know what they're, what they're doing with building, leading to this massive financial loss. But even worse than this, I think, the cost blowout has been without one of the major benefits the new public management was meant to deliver, flexibility and choice. Instead, Diwa and Julia Gillard, in the interests of equity, imposed standardised contracts, guidelines and decisions, which, according to the report of the Australian National Audit Office, made it very difficult for the differing needs of schools to be taken into account. And as we've seen from all those principals in the, and, and heads of school council, schools were given no choice. So it was back to the old size you know, the old one-size-fits-all model of delivery. They were given no choice, which the new public management was meant to displace. But it was delivered by giant construction firms who inflated their prices with um, some spectacular price gouging. And in some cases, they weren't even put to competitive tender. So it seems to me it's sort of been this half assed new public management which has not delivered what it was meant to do, uh, but in which the public sector has to some extent lost, lost control of the process. So the, the, I think these two schemes, the House Insulation Scheme and the BER, show us something else about what's gone on in the last um, couple of decades with the new public management, and that's been a shift in the location of moral hazard from the public sector and its lazy, time-serving, unadventurous, unenterprising public servants. And you can if you remember back to Jeff Kennett's day, you know, he regarded public servants as people who weren't brave enough to take a risk, that, that it, was, it was the place of the sort of morally lazy and deficient was people who ended up in the public sector, like us. Um, and, and so there's been a shift from mo the moral hazard being there to the greedy profiteers and cowboy chances in the, public, in, in the private sector, and as well with the potential for collusive, cosy relationships to develop between the key government purchasing agents and their preferred providers, so that after a, a decade or more of this having set up, it's clear when you drill down into the reports that are coming out from the state education departments that there's been quite, there's quite cosy, collusive relationships um, at work there. It's hard, it seems to me, otherwise to explain the cost differences between the provision of buildings to the public and to the Catholic school sector. Okay, now the failure of the home insulation scheme, however, seems to me to need a little bit more to explain it, for we know the government received a good deal of advice about the problems it was likely to encounter. And we know that the minister, Peter Garrett, was under pressure from Rudd for a quick rollout and that he ignored the advice or that Rudd ignored the advice. So there's more uh, to Rudd, the Rudd government's spectacular failures of policy implementation than the new public management. And I think this brings us to Rudd and the nature of his office. Rudd keeps telling us that the buck stops here, that is the buck stops with him. And he took responsibility for the failures of the home insulation scheme and he's promised to fix the nation's hospitals, as you know, we all expect the nation's hospital to work, and I'm the Prime Minister, so I should make them work. Rudd began his maiden speech in federal politics with the words, politics is about power. That sort of sounds unobjectionable, but as people who do first year Australian politics, politics 101, this is too simple by half, and I think it's the crux of Rudd's problem. It seems to me he doesn't understand the complexity and the limits of the exercise of public power. Power is not only complex, with fundamental differences between coercive power relying on threats and sanctions and legitimate authority, but power in political systems is limited. David Marr's written um, the June quarterly essay on Rudd, and it's called Power Trip, and I think it's going to be out in a week or so, and it's got all the sharp observation and unexpected angles which Marr makes Marr such a fine interpreter of Australian political life. And in it, he quotes a shrewd old bureaucrat who's worked with a few prime ministers who wonders if Rudd really understands the way power works at the top. He isn't afraid to pick a fight, but doesn't then behave like a prime minister. He involves himself so much. He puts himself on the line so quickly. He doesn't exercise authority by keeping at a distance. This is the Rudd of the buck stops with me, who presents himself as the fixer of last resort of all the nation's problems. 
It's the Rudd who rushed in to take the blame for the problems with insulation and who whisked out his notebook um, from his top pocket to take the names of the worried insulators, reassuring them that there'd be another phase of government largesse once the problems were sorted out. Why did he think he had to take all the blame? There were other candidates, shonky small business operators, for example, who never got mentioned. And no one really expects the PM to act as everybody's local member, sorting out their problems for them with this and that government scheme. So there's a failure of judgment here, I think, in Rudd as he promises too much and delivers too little, both in small things uh, like the promise to the insulators and in large policy reversals like the ETS. And I'm sure if the, uh, they go ahead with attempting to fix the nation's hospitals, we'll see a similar pattern. So implicit in these failures of judgment is a fantasy of the concentration of power in the office of the Prime Minister. Buck stop or not in many places in liberal parliamentary democracies like ours. They stop with individual ministers, with state premiers, and behind the scenes with senior public servants. Now, as with most prime ministers, Rudd is focused on power, and so the question becomes what sort of power and what it means to him. He's clearly got a deeply held commitment to making um, Australia a decent place for children to grow up in, and a commitment forged in the hard days and years after his father died. But he, he shows, but he's a man for whom power seems to be a brittle exercise in control, and who's got little understanding of the limits of what one man can do, even when he holds the highest office in the land. Power is also exercised through persuasion. And here, it seems to me, Rudd's got a major blind spot. He doesn't seem, persuasion doesn't seem to be in his concept of, of power. Because he thinks power is concentrated in the office of the PM, he puts little effort into consulting with or attempting to persuade stakeholders in particular policy areas. We know he's very sensitive to voter opinion, um, but he seems to me to have shown little interest in stakeholder opinion. And to just give, I suppose, the example that's in everybody's minds at the moment, it's mind-boggling to me that his government decided to introduce the mining resources tax in an election year without, without consultation with the industry. To take on, it, it seems to take on one of Australia's most powerful interests in an election year is like chiefly taking on the banks. Doesn't Rudd remember what the Australian Mining Industry Council's advertising campaign did to the Hawke government's commitment to national land rights legislation that it was elected um, on in, in 1983. And for those of you too young to remember, basically it killed it. They ran a very sophisticated advertising campaign. Uh, by the end of the 80s, Rudd, and, uh, sorry, not Rudd Hawke says, public opinion's changed, so we're not going ahead with the, na with the national land rights legislation. And the change of public opinion is pretty much the result of the advertising campaign run by the Australian Mining Industries Council. So what's happening now is that having not consulted, uh, the discussions that should have taken place before the policy was announced publicly are now being had in a sort of public advertising war uh, in which, again, the government's twisted away from a prior commitment not to use public money for partisan advertising and in which the government's credibility, even if it happens to sort of win the war, has taken another major dent. So my answer to what's gone wrong is, firstly, there's been these major failures of implementation as the federal government ventures into the delivery of services in which it has very little experience. And second, that Rudd's narrow and brittle misunderstanding of the nature of public power and the need for broad consultation in policy formation is also behind it. Despite all this, I actually think Labor will win the election in the main because Abbott's so problematic and because the Labor front bench looks much more plausible as a government um, than the Liberal shadow cabinet. So now that we're here with the experts. So.